Hello. Today I'm going to give the first of two talks on the concept of cause. Uh, it is, of course, something that is central to scientific and social scientific inquiry. It has also been a topic of great interest to philosophers from Aristotle to the present. Um, I'm going to uh, begin with a brief uh, account of how philosophers have grappled with the problem of cause. And uh, I will do so uh, because I think there's something uh, to learn from their inability uh, to come up with a compelling account of cause. Uh, it suggests that it's not a feature of the world but rather an artifact of the human imagination. Various uh, implications flow from this uh, that are important for our framing of causal inquiry in the social sciences and in international relations in particular. Let me begin with Aristotle who uh, summed up the Greek understandings of cause and offered a fourfold uh, definition. Uh, first, um, in his mind, was material cause. Uh, material cause meant the physical substance from which something was fashioned, a chair being made from wood. A second concept of cause uh, was formal, and by this uh, he referred, the Greek word was paradigma, from which paradigm in English comes from, to the plan that's the basis for something being created. Uh, the way, for example, an architectural blueprint uh, is for the construction of a house. Uh, next came efficient causation. Uh, what event triggered the particular outcome of interest to us? So go back no further than what might also be called its immediate cause. And this understanding of cause became the dominant one in modern science. Finally, Aristotle was interested in telos, or the end for which something was being created. He gave the example of an acorn whose purpose is to produce an oak tree. The Christians took over Aristotle's four conceptions and whereas Aristotle had discouraged people from thinking about original causes, the Christians foregrounded them and attributed them to God. God had set everything in motion. Uh, this Christian view would also uh, feed very nicely into the understanding of science that developed in the aftermath of Newton and Galileo when we came to frame uh, the universe as, uh, as a clock or at least some very complicated kind of mechanical object. It had been set in motion either by God or whatever it was that created it. And cause was a way of um, unraveling how this mechanism worked so that we could have a more holistic uh, picture of the universe but also understand the functioning of its uh, disparate parts. In the modern era, uh, these other Aristotelian categories were uh, shed largely to free science of control by theologians and divinity faculties. But efficient cause also appeared to offer a very uh, useful and concise way of framing causal inquiry. In philosophy, it uh, reached its apogee with the famous writings of Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume, 
uh, who died just a few years before the uh, French Revolution. Um, Hume was particularly interested in distancing himself from uh, moral philosophers, uh, people who emphasize the role of reason uh, to understand how human beings should behave or the ways in which humans use reason to understand the world. He argued uh, most radically that humans were little different from animals uh, in this regard and that what was uh, important were things he called natural, uh, like contiguity, something that comes temporally very close to something else, and identity, uh, that is what uh, we would characterize something as. And his understanding of cause arose from the impressions, he said, that identity and continuity made on the human mind. Uh, if something regularly appeared before something else, we came to think of it as its cause. From Hume's perspective, this was a very useful thing for people to do because on an everyday basis uh, it gave them some insight into the seeming workings of their world uh, it led to the expectation that the future would be very much like the past, that by understanding it, uh, they could cope better with it. Hume never intended uh, this understanding of what he called constant conjunction uh, to become the basis of science. By constant conjunction, it's another way of uh, framing Humean causation, that if A appears before B, and that every time A appears, B follows. A must be the cause of B. This is, of course, a very thin understanding of cause because it dispenses with any interest or need to understand what about A might be responsible for the appearance of B. Hume thought it was sufficient uh, to have a constant or near constant conjunction. Now, Remember, Hume is talking more like one of today's cognitive psychologists trying to understand how people make causal attributions. Uh, he's not suggesting in any way that cause should be framed this way or that his conception of cause should be the foundation of scientific inquiry. Uh, this nevertheless happened. Uh, regularity theories, which are arguably the, still the dominant uh, method of analysis in the social sciences, derived directly from Hume's understanding of constant conjunction. Researchers who do quantitative work or surveys or use data of any kind look for high degree of correlation between a variable that could be a cause, an independent variable, and its effect, a dependent variable. And if they find these close associations, and even better, if they find that in the absence of A, B doesn't occur, then they argue with some degree of confidence that we should consider A as a cause of B. Now, as we know, life is never so simple because in the social world there are uh, multiple causes of almost all events and we never find um, constant conjunctions. Uh, if we say that arms races are a cause of war, which may well be the case, and we have a data set, we will find that there are indeed wars that were preceded by arms races, but also many wars that were not preceded by arms races, and arms races that did not lead to war. So we end up, particularly in international relations, with 
imperfect conjunctions. And this encourages us to do exactly what uh, Hume and regularity theorists uh, have avoided doing, which is looking for the mechanisms and processes that might link A to B to allow us to better account for this variation and to improve our hit rate in making explanations or predictions. Uh, the problem, of course, with most mechanisms and processes, and I'll give a separate talk uh, on them at, later, is that uh, they're not necessarily observables. They're metaphysical. They're things we invoke uh, that we might test for and use or theorize, uh, but we can't directly observe or measure. And for many people, certainly for the positivists, and especially for the Vienna Circle, uh, this is a huge uh, no-no. So uh, this, in a way, uh, brings uh, 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 positivist uh, uh, regularity theories into a kind of aporia. Uh, they want to dispense with metaphysics and only deal with observables, but regularities are never constant enough to allow this. So instead, we have to move to looking for mechanisms, but to do so, we have to engage at a metaphysical level. Now, um, there are uh, further developments in our story of cause. It doesn't end uh, with you. Uh, Hume, in fact, met uh, considerable criticism at the outset. Uh, uh, one of his uh, Scottish Enlightenment uh, colleagues uh, said to him, well, Monday night always precedes Tuesday morning, yet you could hardly say it's its cause. Uh, indeed, uh, Monday night precedes Tuesday morning by convention. It's not a causal relationship. And there may also be uh, empirical findings of uh, relationships that are entirely um, spurious. Uh, there's a wonderful website called Spurious Correlations, and if you have some time, uh, check it out. And you'll see that uh, it finds uh, high levels of association between such things as movies made by Leonard DiCaprio and earthquakes in California, um, things which are, are clearly unrelated, uh, but nevertheless appear to be if we simply search for regularities. So this puts a premium on finding uh, the links, and this of course involves um, a different kind of research. Now, um, John Stuart Mill attempted to overcome uh, some of these problems by formulating his method of similarity and method of a difference. Uh, they have become much more than Hume the foundation for regularity theories in um, the social sciences. Uh, an early critic of them was John Stuart Mill's godson, Bertrand Russell, uh, who thought that cause was a concept that had outlived its utility. Uh, he thought it only survived uh, because, as he uh, put it, uh, presumably with a smile, that people thought it caused no more harm than the monarchy and were mistaken uh, on both uh, grounds. Uh, Russell observed uh, astutely that what Hume called identity uh, is not something that is natural but rather is a function of our categories and therefore that any kind of study of regularity that compares X and Y requires a prior theory that both determines what is X and what is Y but also why they are important. Um, this 
complicates uh, regularity analysis uh, still uh, more so, and we can see this in international relations, where uh, the concept of war uh, is central to the study of international relations. But, but what's a war? Well, most data sets, uh, using the definition from the correlates of war study, define it as a violent interaction between recognized states in which there are over a thousand casualties. There are many people who think that this is an entirely inadequate definition of war and that it lumps together all kinds of conflicts that are not really um, comparable. So these are serious conceptual issues uh, that arise associated with uh, the study of cause in a positivist uh, way. Uh, what I want to do in my next talk is to look at cause from an interpretivist uh, perspective uh, to lay out an argument for interpretivist understandings uh, to show you the different way in which a cause might be constructed in international relations but also uh, the kinds of problems that this too uh, raises for scholars. Thank you.